Hi, I'm Tamara Kendacker, in for Jamie Poisson. Gouvernement comme Abdija a prêté l'école immédiatement après l'installation on Monday, Ariel Henry, the unelected prime minister of Haiti, released a video announcing his resignation. He recorded that video not from inside his country, but from Puerto Rico. He's been prevented from returning to Haiti by an unprecedented surge in violence, unleashed by a coalition of gangs who've come together to overthrow him. Haiti is on a brink of becoming a failed state. A gangland rebellion is ripping through the republic. The human toll, hunger, violence, and unrest has been unthinkable. The UN now says 15,000 people have been displaced over just the past week. Henri took over in 2021, following the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. Henri promised to restore order and to lead Haiti into new elections. Instead, the country's descended even further into violence and insecurity. The out of control violence escalating over the last week when the same gangs who once fought each other then banded together, attacking airports, police stations, the presidential palace, even prisons, releasing thousands of inmates into the streets. Now, as international diplomats scramble to cobble together a transitional government, Haiti remains gripped by hunger and bloodshed and it's unclear who's gonna lead the country out of this chaos. To understand how the crisis reached this point and what could happen next, I'm joined by Weedlore Marincor. He's the editor-in-chief of Aibo Post, a Haitian online news organization and a regular contributor to the Washington Post. Hi, Weedlore. Welcome back to Front Burner. Thanks so much for doing this. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. So tell me about what life has been like in the streets of Port-au-Prince over the last uh, week or so. Over the last few weeks, life in Port-au-Prince has been, you know, extremely difficult. And it is on top of a situation that was already untenable before the last week when the gangs uh, in Port-au-Prince waged a series of coordinated attacks on Haitian institutions. They attacks burned down or damaged at least 12 police stations according to a police union they attacked the two biggest uh, penitentiary uh, in Port-au-Prince Aquade Bouquet and the Haitian National Penitentiary um you know releasing thousands of inmates some of them you know criminals of you know, the, the highest caliber. A 72-hour state of emergency declared after armed gangs stormed two of the nation's largest prisons. Close to 4,000 prisoners reportedly escaped during the violent assault. The exact death toll is unknown, but bodies were seen lining the streets of Port-au-Prince as police unions publicly pleaded for backup. They essentially blocked uh, many institutions, making it impossible for them to operate. Gangs have in recent days attacked the country's container port, international airport, and central bank. Nothing seems to be functioning here anymore. Thousands of people are fleeing their homes. Many are having to queue up to get clean water. Some tell all and, and can I ask, how have you been feeling about your own safety? How is this affecting your day-to-day -day life, your ability to get food, go to work? that kind of thing? You know, conversations about what are we going to do if the gangs come to our neighborhood is common uh, where I live, you know. A couple of days ago, the gangs attacked the Haitian National Palace and the gunshots were so closed um, that uh, I, you know, tried to get ready, put on my sneakers, just in case uh, something happened. Um, yeah. and it is you know, a situation that is extremely tough to be in. Um, when you go to work, it is not uncommon to see um, you know, dead bodies uh, in the streets, sometimes burnt down, uh, because most institutions in Haiti today 
especially in port prince are not functioning properly. The morgues, I talked to some of them, they say it's difficult, especially when the gangs are operating, to go out and pick up corpses. Uh, if you are shot, um, you know, God forbid, this is one of the biggest fear of people in port prince today, mm -hmm. to be hit by straight bullets. Um, hospitals, many of them are closed. Uh, because of gang violence and those who are still functioning they will tell you they have they are close to shortages of fuel they are close to shortages of medicines and all all, the, all sorts of other things that are necessary um, to function properly uh, in the supermarkets you can see there are still some products but uh, there is fear that uh, the prices that are extremely high makes food and and and, and so many other necessities um you know very difficult for poor people or the overall majority of people living in apartments uh makes it inaccessible while Haiti's political crisis plays out more than a million people are now on the brink of famine that's coming from the world food program which is struggling to feed them it's a losing battle because the country and especially the capital are cut off from outside supplies. And there is also fear that we can have shortages anytime if the police officers, you know, cannot control the situation. And if the gangs were all powerful and probably more powerful today than they were, you know, in the past years, um, if they did, they decided to sow more chaos uh, in Puerto Rico. Wow, I can't I can't imagine how stressful that is and I imagine the the port situations also making things worse. I appreciate you sharing all of that with us and and taking the time to even talk to us right now. I wonder if we can do a brief overview of Ariel Henry's time in office. So, he became the de facto leader of the country following the assassination of former president Jovenel Moise but he was not elected by the Haitian public. And just briefly, without getting into too many of the details, who did select him to lead the country? Well, uh, Ariel Henry was selected to become prime minister a couple of days before the assassination, the 7th of July 2021, of then the president of Haiti, Jovenel Moïse, who was very contested leader. The brazen attack unfolded overnight at the private residence of Haitian President Jovenel Moise. The gunmen speaking English and Spanish reportedly yelled they were DEA agents, but the Haitian government says they were instead mercenaries, highly trained killers who shot dead the 53-year-old Moise and critically wounded his wife. Right after this assassination, the cabinet of Ayanli was not, uh, poor, you know, in place, there was a prime minister at the time, and he intended to lead the country to the next elections. However, um, the international community in Haiti, led by the U.S., put out a press release you know, on, on their banner called Core Group, which is a collection of um, and embassies and other institutions operating, foreign institutions operating uh, in, in Haiti. And they, you know, encouraged Ariel Henry to form his cabinet and lead the country. And this is at the time that uh, Claude Joseph, then the prime minister, accepted to resign and to, you know, give power to Ariel Henry. Yeah. And, and if I'm understanding correctly, this was supposed to be temporary, right? He was just supposed to lead Haiti th through to the new elections. But what has happened instead? Ariel Henry made several promises when he became prime minister. And his primary goal was to organize quickly elections and to make sure that this country today where we have zero elected officials can come to some sense of normalcy in terms of how the institutions are working. We will create a secure, reliable and stable environment to facilitate political activities throughout the country. We will expect massive participation in the next presidential elections, the highest participation of citizens of voting age. However, he, the many promises he made, um, you know, did not materialize. The last one was 
to give power to elected officials on the 7th of February this year. However, that did not happen. And the security that he promised so many times in so many speeches um, did not materialize quite the country. Right. And, and then under his leadership for the last two and a half years, how has gang violence intensified? Gangs violence today in Haiti are probably the worst uh, in the past decade. You know, if you talk to experts, they will tell you the 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 holds of gangs in so many territories. You know, controlling so much of the Haitian uh, life is unheard of. Um, although we had this gang problem before he, he came in power. But what we are observing today is the collapsing of the rest of the institutions, mm -hmm. the few ones that, you know, were still functioning since he became prime minister. Hundreds of thousands of people had to flee their homes because of gangs violence, you know. Yeah. When gangs came to territories, you have all sorts of brutal, violent actions, burning down of houses, um, collective rape, and, and, and so many. We, we put out a report with the Washington Post recently um, speaking with uh, women who were sexually abused. And, you know, because Haiti doesn't have abortion um, and because abortion, uh, when you have the money and the means to do it, is so expensive and mm -hmm. so um, inaccessible for, for most folks. They carry on pregnancies with kids that they don't know who's the, who is the father. And even if they did, they would, I believe, despise um, this, these people because the, the, the child comes from extreme violence. So the, the situation in terms of security is today worse than it was um, when he came in power. So these attacks were spearheaded by the gang leader Jimmy Cherizier, known as Barbecue. And many experts seem to be speculating that Barbecue is now the most powerful man in Haiti. So tell me a bit about him. What do we need to know about him? Well, it's important to be cautious when you talk about the most powerful gang leader in Haiti. Um, because it depends on how you define powerful. So who is Jimmy Chaizé? Jimmy Chaizé is a former police officer. He rose to prominence in Haiti um, in 2018 uh, because he was accused of massacring regular citizens in a slum called La Saline. And after that massacre, he left the Haitian National Police to become the thug that uh, he's known for today. Um, you know, in this context, he created what he called G9. The G9 was a coalition of the nine biggest gangs uh, in the country. Uh, he is the spokesperson mm -hmm. for the gangs. So that makes him the most visible uh, gang leader uh, in Haiti. Although he is the feared leader of a violent criminal gang, Cherose appears to be trying to reinvent himself as a leader, a man of the people, battling a corrupt system and the current government led by Prime Minister Ariel Henry, whom Cherose condemns. The others, they speak, for instance, someone like Izo, uh, which is you know probably the biggest kidnapper in the country, he used TikTok to, you know, spread fear and chaos uh, amongst the population, but he's not a very political person, you know. He, he would not be making speeches and interacting with journalists as Jimmy Chagizier does. So I believe he's vocal. He's probably the most vocal gang leader in Haiti. We are fighting for another society, another Haiti, that is not only for the 5% of the people who keep all the wealth, but a new Haiti, where everyone can have food, clean water, so they can have a decent house to live in. Another Haiti where we don't have to leave the country. But when it comes to the, the, the firepower, when it comes to how many guns you have under your direct control, I don't think he's, he's, he's the most powerful. However, he is very influential. That's yeah. for sure. 
Yeah. And so what has he said about why the gangs wanted to band together with this goal of overthrowing Henri? Well, the official line for the gangs and for Jimmy Cherizier's band is what they call the revolution. Okay, it's mm-hmm. a rhetoric that we hear so many times from Jimmy Cherizier. He wants to attack the corrupt class of politicians and the corrupt class of businesses and bring, you know, back power or take power to, for the population. This system is criminal. The revolution we are preaching today, we cannot do this without guns, because we have our own guns. This gun is a symbol of our revolution, the revolution against the 5% of those who hold all the wealth of our nation. But it's a rhetoric. It's a rhetoric. The the victims of the violence of these gangs, the victims of the kidnappings, the victims of the, the, the rape, the victims of the, the businesses that are being burned, you know, most of them are poor people. Uh, in Haiti, the, the the very people that his revolution is supposed to help. Mm. Yeah, right. Even though he portrays himself as this Robin Hood type figure, talks about being inspired by people like MLK Jr., Malcolm X, Fidel Castro. He's known for this violence that ultimately affects the poorest people. Yes, and it is something that we need to be extremely careful uh, because. He knows that this speech is going to make waves, especially in international media. And you also have so many, sometimes, you know, foreign journalists coming to Haiti, believing uh, that speech and giving him a platform that so many people in Haiti do not think he deserves. Mm. No one in Haiti today would follow, um, you know, willingly uh, Jimmy Cherizé or would, you know, be sad if something was to happen to him. That's how he's, you know, not liked um, because the population is fed up and has enough of the, the actions of, 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 of his and his men of, of gangs. However, it, it sells well to introduce yourself as some some form of revolutionary leader against the rich and the and the corrupt politicians in a context mm-hmm. where you have so much inequality in a context where the, the the Haitian population the vast majority of it is living in poverty and in a country where quite frankly we are some of the gem, the, the best in terms of uh, corruption in the whole region yeah. Do, do you have a sense then of what the gangs really want if it's not revolution to help poor people in the country? Like, what is their end goal? Well, their end goal is power and money. Mm-hmm. It's an old story, uh, quite frankly. And it's not just Haitian, a Haitian story. Uh, but in, in, in the Haitian context today, I believe what they are looking for, they did not want a foreign force to come in Haiti. Um, because if this force is effective and has equipment and has professionals who know, you know, how to conduct effective operations, that is practically an end to the reign of terror in Haiti. But if they cannot do uh, such feat, I think the second goal would be to corrupt the political uh, discussions and and, 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 and and negotiations to have what is being called an amnesty today. Meaning, even if such force was to come, even if the reign was to come to an end at some point, they would go free without any actions, without justice, without any repercussion for their actions in the past years. Now that Henri has agreed to resign, what is supposed to happen moving forward? The framework that is emerging so far is a presidential council of nine members. Seven would have voting power and they would pick a new prime minister and, 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 and you know, bring some sort of normalcy to the country. And uh, maybe at some point we will have elections and, and you know. A new renewal 
of the democratic experience mm -hmm. uh, in Haiti. Yeah. But uh, Henri was pushed out by these gangs. And I'm wondering how likely is it, do you think, that they will allow the transition to some other authority? Well, uh, there are rumors uh, today that uh, they don't just oppose what is being discussed. They don't just oppose it because they feel like they are sidelined by, you know, on these negotiations. There are rumors that they plan to conduct some high profile actions, the same type of those they, you know, initiated uh, a couple of weeks ago when they attacked the, the prisons, they attacked uh, so many police stations, killing brutally, you know, uh, mercilessly, uh, police officers uh, and, 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 and so many poor people were victims. Uh, we, we have yet to know what they are going to do, but what is certain is they are extremely powerful. And if there is nothing, you know, in front of them to stop, you know, their actions, the civil population today in Haiti will fall victims of, you know, their violence. Mm hmm and then one last thing that feels worth touching on before I let you go is that um, Henri was, in essence, put in power by a group of international diplomats. And in fact, Haitians haven't picked their leader since 2016. And like you, you mentioned this throughout our conversation, this is a country that has a long history of foreign intervention. What kind of impact do you think that has on this situation? But I do think that's the probably the most important part of the war conversation today. You are in a country when, at least since the assassination of the Haitian national president, the population was asking the international community to let them resolve that situation. So many stakeholders were asking for a Haitian-led solution to the world crisis, but they were muted, not heard, um, you know, and the, the many protests that they organized did not bring about any change in the policies of, you know, embassies like the European embassy here, like the US uh, or France, right? You have now meetings on the future of Haiti being conducted outside of Haiti and sometimes without any Haitian presence whatsoever. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is an old story, and so many here fear that the future won't look that much different from the past, because if the voices of Haiti, the folks who knows this country, the folks who understand the Haitian history and Haitian culture and Haitian ways, of habitating this space are not heard and do not have enough weight in the discussion, the solution proposed won't be effective. That's what they fear. We Lord, thanks so much for, for taking the time and for all your insight and explaining this to us. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, that's all for today. Front Burner was produced this week by Matt Muse, Ali Janes, Sarah Jackson, and Derek Vanderwijk. Sound design was by Mackenzie Cameron, Marco Luciano, and Sam McNulty. Music is by Joseph Shabison. Our senior producer is Elaine Chow. Our executive producer is Nick McCabe Locos. The show is hosted by Jamie Poisson and this week by Ali Janes and me, Tamara Kandacker. Thanks so much for listening. Front Burner will be back on Monday.